Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. This is a good one, especially if you're a woman. If you're a man, you also will learn a lot too. We definitely sprinkle that in. Or if you want to understand your woman better, we get into conversations about birth control. So you might want to know that information, but Dr. Stacy Sims is an exercise physiologist and she's a nutrition scientist. So I've been listening to her for a while now. And every time I listen, I learn something new. She's so smart. She understands a woman's body from a biological standpoint, hormonal standpoint, recovery, exercise, nutrition. She's just so well informed. And, you know, they're just so few and far between those who understand the woman's body really well, because, well, at the end of the day, they're not well researched. I mean, they were using male rats for breast implants. It's just crazy how underrepresented women are from a, from a study perspective to know exactly what's going on with the body. So today it was, it was just really, really thorough conversation on everything around eating, refueling, fueling for the workout, when to train, how to train, what time of day, um, where to get your most bioavailable proteins, split training for body recomposition, what the most effective way is to lose weight. I learned so much today and going to apply that into my life now. So I hope that is the same for you. And we could just start to understand a woman's body better. And uh, her famous statement is that women are not small men. And you're going to hear that today. Okay. Thanks for doing this. I'm yeah. listening I'm, I'm. to so much of your stuff and like, I've been through such my own health journey over the last couple of years. And so anytime that someone's talking, especially in particular to women's health and women's hormones and training and just how to refeed and just all the different things that it takes to be healthy, I'm so tuned in because I feel like what I was doing in my mid thirties that worked and it did work for a while just isn't wasn't sustainable like two a days like low carb like probably generally low calorie um you know just high all high intensity i mean even the second workout would be an interval workout it wasn't yeah. like just some super low impact something um and i just between that and you know changing jobs, changing relationships, changing where I live, just so many different things. I just, my, the whole system just went, I hate you. And everything just shut down. And it really all kind of launched by me losing my cycle, which is okay. such an ultimate indicator of general health for a woman. Um, if you're in the reproductive years. And so I went to the doctor and the first thing he said, which was like, I thought, oh my God, this is it. It'll fix everything. He's like, oh, your thyroid is really low. And I'm like, there it is. That's it. This explains the weight gain. This explains, uh, you know, being a little more lethargic. This explains just so much. Oh my gosh, everything's going to be better. And I just thought this magic pill was going to be everything. And that was April of 2021. And it's now early 2023. And I'm literally about six, about four weeks into feeling like, oh my God, my body finally is responding. Wow. It took that long and that many things doing everything from NAD to hyperbaric chamber to um, peptides, to elimination diets, to gut protocols, to, I mean, I did everything and anything you could possibly imagine to try and do it. I mean, fasting, cleanses, uh, cutting out alcohol, you name it, like any, anything that could possibly work. So anyway, I think this is just an important conversation. I'm not going to do much talking from here on out. Um, but I just think that women's hormones are just, you know, and, and, and a woman's system is just so much more intricate. I want to say the word complicated, and I think that is true, but at, at least it's much more intricate and there's a lot more to it. And, um, and it's, uh, it's a puzzle and I just want to do anything I can to give women the opportunity to put the puzzle pieces together and have control of their body and their life again, and, um, or maybe learn about it for the first time. So maybe I think the first question is like, what are some of the most detrimental things that, um, that, 
a woman can do to, and if there's a part where a man fits into this fine, but I'm really coming at this from my my perspective. Um, What are some detrimental things that women need to be on the lookout for, like, or even trends in the last 10, 15 years that, um, that are really something to, to question? Uh, So when I first heard your story, the first thing I said was in my head was red S relative energy deficiency in sport. Because people are often diagnosed with thyroid dysfunction, but then they have gut issues, they have weight gain, they have bone issues, stress reactions, mental health issues, cardiovascular issues, and it's that big picture and physicians don't know it. So I'd say some of the biggest detrimental things that come out in the trends is intermittent fasting, fasted training, the ketogenic diet, um, some of the continuous high intensity when it's not properly high And people don't understand that it's just putting them in a tired, modern intensity state. Um, So those would be the big ones that have been the trends, really. And so when I'm looking at it and and hearing your story, and I hear it a lot as well, it's like, okay, because all the stuff that gets pushed out into the Fitzbo media, into popular media, even into things like the well and good articles, it's all based on male data. So if we take something like fasted training, Mm -hmm. and we see you know, we're supposed to become more, quote, metabolically efficient and burn more fat. In men, yes. But in women, we know women do better in a fed state because our metabolism during exercise is different. Mm. So we don't have to train to become more, quote, metabolically efficient or have flexibility because our bodies are already there by the nature of being born XX or XXY, and we have estrogen progesterone. So when we start really digging into the pieces, and I hear so many women who are, you know, I don't understand what's happening. I'm doing all the things right, but I'm really tired. I'm putting on belly fat. I can't hit my intensities. I'm tired, but wired. So when we start to unpack it and understand, oh, they're doing fasted training or they're doing intermittent fasting, not particularly time-restricted eating because there's a difference there. And they're doing nothing but high intensity, high intensity, high intensity, and lots of resistance training. It's like, okay, we have to stop, pause, unpack it. Let's see how old you are. Are you on an oral contraceptive pill or not? We naturally cycling. What are those cycles like? If you're in your 40s or beyond, we really have to unpack it because we have to understand, are you perimenopausal yet or not? When is that coming? And it's a lifespan because men age in a linear fashion. So all the data we see on aging, all the data we see on metabolism, it's all based on this linear model where men just kind of tick along and they age and they don't have a discernible set point where all of a sudden, boom, their testosterone just plummets. But for women, we have it when we hit perimenopause and we start seeing changes in our estrogen and our progesterone. It's a discernible point where women start to age and no one tells them what's going on. So then you hit that one point in time menopause and they're like, oh my God, what? has happened. Can you delay that? Is this a biological rhythm that is out of your control when you hit perimenopause and then essentially menopause? Or can your lifestyle and sort of taking care of your hormones properly, can that delay that process? No, you can't delay it, but you can definitely make it better. Because when we look at all the conversations around what you should do for perimenopause and the 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise and two days of resistance training, all that standard stuff does not work for women who are in their early to mid 40s onwards. Hmm. And I say that, I see your face, and I say that because when we're looking at that moderate intensity, that's exactly the area of exercise intensity women don't want to be in when they're experiencing changes in their hormones, because when we have a drop in progesterone, we end up in a greater sympathetic drive. So this is why I say, you know, women are always saying I'm tired, but wired. Mm -hmm. And we have a greater baseline level of cortisol because the body's under extreme stress. So when we put ourselves in that moderate intensity, which also falls into things like the orange theory, the F45s, the bootcamp classes, Mm -hmm. Then you end up with this greater cortisol and this greater sympathetic drive, which then stimulates the body to put on more body fat. And you never really get into a parasympathetic good sleep pattern. You don't recover very well. And you get into this well, what's going on? I'm going to start restricting calories because I'm putting weight on, which then pulls them into low energy availability. And it's this vicious cycle. Yep. Yeah, that's totally. I mean, that was me. Like, it all probably started <clears throat> when I was about 30, 
six, seven, and kind of kept going down. And I just kept thinking, actually, the first thing that hit me is I was like, I wonder if it's my hormones. And then I just did what an, an type A person does. I just said, try harder. And yep. so you work out more and eat less and it just all continues to spiral. And so that, that spiraled for a good four years before yep. I finally sort of, I don't know what seems like has been the, the solution is, um, and I want to talk about the training after this, um, changing my f- workouts to being pretty much just strength training three days a week, every other day. And then on those every other days with still one full day off is just like 40 minutes of super easy, low intensity, like just like walking uphill. Um, and then also dropping my fat to kind of still keep calories in check um, and upping my carbohydrates a lot. Like, and complex, not like fibrous, contra- com- not just all fibrous, like vegetable based um, carbohydrates, but rice and sweet potatoes and stuff that I was generally avoiding. Um, does that sound like the reason why things were getting back on track or is there still issues within those sort of shifts? Cause I'm 40. One, you're probably in low carbohydrate availability. And a lot of women are afraid of carbohydrates because of all the messaging, right? Mm. Don't have bread, don't have potatoes, don't mm. have rice, none of this, yes. but women need carbs. And if we have a low amount of carbohydrate availability, then our brain perceives it as low energy density. So it starts to conserve. And we see after four days of this, your thyroid starts to take a hit. So you end up in a low end of normal. It's the first thing that happens. So if you go to the physician and they're like, oh, you have low thyroid, instead of trying to dig a bit more and look at like luteinizing hormone pulse, is that off? What about estrogen, progesterone? What's going on there? They're like, oh, you have hypothyroidism. Here's here's some pills. Let's try that. Yeah. But if we take a step back and go, okay, well, let's look at carbohydrate availability. Let's up carbohydrate, especially in and around training. Then the hypothalamus is like, hey, sweet, there's fuel here for this training stress. Mm -hmm. And there's fuel still available for me to do all the things I need to do, including keeping a healthy endocrine system. So your thyroid doesn't take a hit. And one of the things that we have found in research is that even if you aren't eating enough calories, but you are bookending your training with adequate carbohydrate and protein, your hypothalamus doesn't perceive you as being in a low energy state. So when we look for like athletes or um, recreationally really competitive people who are trying to drop a little bit of weight, we really make sure that we have that nutrient timing nailed down. And then we can afford to have a calorie deficit without impacting hormones and without impacting sleep. So it has to do with that stress for men. They can get away with not necessarily doing nutrient timing because when we look at carbohydrate and calorie sensitivity for men, it's around 15 calories per kilogram of fat-free mass before they start having endocrine dysfunction. But for women, we know that you start to have a disruption around 30. So women's threshold is completely different from men because we have two areas in the brain in the hypothalamus that read this and men have one. Mm. So when you're seeing thyroid dysfunction, you start seeing irregularities in your menstrual cycle. It's a hypothalamus going, Hey, wait, 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 wait. We have a problem here. Mm. So this is why I'm so adamant about women tracking their menstrual cycles so that you can have the opportunity to take a step back when you start seeing these irregularities and you can pull yourself back before you get into significant issues. Yeah. Well, let's um let's talk about then fasted training. And, you know, again, I'm just gonna be selfish and use myself as an example. You're right. Um, I also so my training when I strength train in the morning for about an hour and 15 minutes, um, is at like 6 45 in the morning. And so I don't eat before that. And trust me, like I am not afraid to, it's not a problem. Um, I used to actually, when I was, you know, years ago when I would work out later in the day, I always ate first and people go to the gym and they would have not ate before. I'm like, how can you do that? I feel terrible if I don't eat first. Um, so maybe that was some saving grace along the way while I was super pushing myself, but, um, but I don't right now. And so, um, I'm curious kind of how to go about that and, 
you know, while still, so like, is there any benefit to not eating before you work out? For women, not really. We really? see that, yeah, we see there's a blunting in your fatty acid oxidation if you don't eat. And there is also a blunting in your like muscle contractile strength. Huh. So your adaptations aren't as great either. Hmm. And it doesn't take a lot. Like when we're looking specifically at resistance training, mm -hmm. we see that 15 grams of protein beforehand significantly improves the, your ability to hit what you need to during that session, does not blunt fatty acid oxidation throughout the rest of the day, and also increases your EPOC or your excessive post-oxygen consumption. So your elevated metabolism, and it, it's a favorable thing that lasts for quite a few hours afterwards. Not the same with just carbohydrate. It's a protein that's really important, for, especially for resistance training. If you're going to do resistance training and then like sprint interval training right after or any kind of cardiovascular work, you have to add in some carbohydrate just to help with that higher intensity from a cardi cardiovascular standpoint. Mm -hmm. I'm always notorious for my protein coffee before like I swam this morning, and hence the Google eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, so protein coffee, it's like I have a, a double espresso that I make the night before, put in some almond milk, scoop of protein powder. Uh, three grams of creatine and boom out the door. So I have my protein. I have a little bit of carbohydrate from the almond milk and then caffeine, of course, because I'm one of those people that needs a shot of coffee in the morning. Yeah. I love coffee. Is there a downside yeah. to coffee? Not that we're aware of. Like it's not a diuretic. If you're someone who's a fast metabolizer, you might end up having too much because you're like, hey, I like that. Oh, it's gone. Oh, I want another one. But <laughs> other than that, not really. So get 15 grams of protein in if you're train strength training. And if you're adding in a little bit of cardio at any point, um, you want to add 10 or 15 okay. grams of carbohydrate. We say about 30, 30. Yeah. Okay. So all up, you're looking at maybe 150 calories total before you're doing a strength and, and cardiovascular type workout. Otherwise it's around a hundred calories from protein. Okay. Which is well, not that's a lot. Yeah. That's more than 15 grams though. Right. I mean, so like 20 grams ish. Yeah. Five, yeah. Five, so five. they say 90, but who does 90 calories? You're like, what's 90? <laughs> yeah. We'll just round it up. <laughs> yeah. What's the role of fat? Cause you know, fat, you know, fat coffee or bulletproof coffee kind of thing has been such a craze is fat, uh, detrimental or is it just not helpful? And so if you're looking from a training perspective, it takes a really long time to get out of your stomach and intestines. So it doesn't really fuel you in any scope of the matter. The thing with bulletproof coffee and all of the things that they're like, here's your MCTs in your coffee, it's for satiation. It's to help with that. Okay, let's get that cognitive focus and hold that caffeine because sure. it extends the half-life of caffeine. Oh. It also clears out your blood sugar. So you feel like your focus, but really you're just on the edge of being hypoglycemic. <laughs> and so it's about the satiation and extending the half-life of the caffeine. Yeah. Cause it is satiating. It does curb your hunger. When I, again, like I said, I did a lot of fasting and I mean, I was like 24, 36, 18, 24, you know, like doing like big fasts and, or what <laughs> feels like big fast. Cause I don't like to be hungry. Um, it, I mean, coffee with a little bit of fat or like a, you know, nut butter, like a, like a cup, like a fat cup, fat bomb kind of thing. Like yep. that stuff would be like, I mean, you could survive on 200 calories a day or 300, just like, because you've kept enough fat in you to, to satiate, but that makes sense with the caffeine too. It extends that life. Okay. Just using me as an example for the morning workout people, what about afterwards with a refeed timing? Like what kind of macros are more important after? Specific for strength training. When you are in your reproductive years, it's 30 grams of good quality protein, high leucine containing protein. When we start to hit late perimenopause and menopause, it's 40 grams because we have more anabolic resistance. So if we want to make the strength training work for us, we also had to have a higher amount of circulating amino acids post-exercise. And we see that it's a 30 to 45 minute window after strength training to really get that in for women. For men, it's a different story because you see, oh, it's not that important for the nutrient timing for men. But again, it's because the way that they come back down to baseline is different from women. They can hold off having 
um, food for up to two to three hours before they really take a hit. But for women, it's such a short window because we come back down to baseline so quickly. And then should it be more, does the carbohydrate or fat matter with fueling after a workout? For strength training, not so much. But if we're looking at a cardiovascular standpoint, we look to get about one gram of carbohydrate with that 30 grams of protein. So one gram per kilogram. So what is that? Trying to convert my head from metric to imperial. So if it's one gram per kilo, so it'd be half a gram per pound of carbohydrate with your 30 grams of protein. What about muscle synthesis? Is it called muscle synthesis or protein synthesis when you kind of have a certain amount of protein every so often in the day? There's like mm-hmm. a mechanism there. What 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 is that? Yeah. So that's your muscle protein synthesis or your mTOR. We look at regular distribution throughout the day to keep a certain amount of amino acids circulating so that you're getting a feedback that, okay, we're going to turn it off and then we're going to turn it on. Then we're going to turn it off and then we're going to turn it on. I think this is also where that conversation of, well, you can't have more than 25 grams of protein because it's not absorbed. It comes from, which is not true. Mm. We see that there's a certain amount that will turn on the mTOR and anything above that isn't that beneficial for muscle protein synthesis, Okay, but it is beneficial for other things in the body like neurotransmitter health, gut health, where other things are using amino acids. So when we're talking about like that 30 gram hit for women, it's not that the extra five grams isn't going to be absorbed or it's going to be turned into fat. That's complete BS. We look at it as like, we need that extra leucine that's coming from those 30 grams to really tip over the amount of leucine that's in the muscle to keep that mTOR working for women. And the extra essential amino acids that are circulating is going to go for neurotransmitter health or some of the other aspects like within the gut or nervous system. Now for men, it's that 20 grams because that's all they need to tip over that, that mTOR. And yeah, if they're getting a little bit more, again, they have more circulating for other things. Hmm. So, and then if you do that, it's like four times a day, is that, or what is the, what is the magic formula to activate mTOR and what does mTOR do? So mTOR is, um, it is a protein that actually stimulates the satellite cell to develop. And so this is where we're talking about muscle protein synthesis. We're talking about the proteins that develop into muscle cells. Got it. So it starts in the brain and feeds forward to the muscle. And so it's a feedback mechanism. Mm-hmm. We're looking at how to keep that kind of even throughout the day. We say around 30 grams at each meal. Mm-hmm. So that's three times and then 15 grams at each snack. And then if you're training hard, then you're going to be altering a little bit because there's a certain set amount of protein that you want to get in a day. That baseline is about 1.1 grams per pound, especially Mm -hmm. as we get older. And then you can divide it up. So you might need to have a little bit more at your meal. You might look at having a little bit more, especially Mm post-exercise. So it depends on where you are and what you're doing with your training, as well as just keeping it at regular intervals throughout the day. Okay. So a little bit more with around training, maybe a little bit less otherwise. And is there a certain amount of meals in a day? Cause I feel like that's another, it's another area that's come and gone so much is like, you know, lots of little meals throughout the day to the theory of just, you know, OMAD one meal or two meals and having long, long windows of, you know, time restricted feeding. Um, what is, what is best for, I mean, if you want to cover, cover the bases, men and women, but definitely for, for women in general, like what is, what is the right amount of meals to have in a day? I don't know if it's the right amount of meals because that's kind of individual, but there's a lot of really cool, interesting research coming out about your circadian rhythm. Okay. And we know that women's rhythms are a little bit longer than men's. So Mm -hmm. this is why we tend to want to go to bed earlier and get up earlier because our, our circadian is a little bit different than men's. So if we're looking at how cortisol peaks and drops and how our hormones pulse and drop, because it does throughout the day, we have pulses. We know that eating more up to about the one o'clock period and then starting to taper down and having a little bit more of your carbohydrate scope in the earlier part of the day and more of the protein scope towards the afternoon Mm. is how it works with your body's rhythm. And then when we get into people who are like, oh, I've been doing time restricted eating and I need to do this and that. It's like, well, first let's look at that research has been done on rats, has been done on men, and it's been on done on 
obese, sedentary women. But if you're really hard and fast pulled to that rule, then stop eating after dinner and then eat breakfast. So you have a 12 hour window overnight, which is really called regular eating, but then you're also giving your body a little little break with your circadian rhythm. So the best is that, I I mean, that's probably the most common. I fasting just isn't my favorite and, um, uh, it never has been, but I tried. Yeah. And but what feels logical is somewhere around that twelve or thirteen hours, whatever that circadian sort of more fasting window. Um, so is that is that something safe that you can do all the time? Then, yeah, absolutely. Because if we're looking at like the big scope for health, right? Mm-hmm. We see all these little trends where you're trying to m- micromanage your body composition, you're micromanaging how you feel, but it's not long term, like. If you're looking at long term, who can do time restricted or fasting for you know your 16 hour fast, that kind of stuff, right? It's not that sustainable for life. So when we pull it back down to more granular and we're looking at the way that our body responds to day and night, and we see that we have this circadian rhythm that also changes across the seasons with daylight, mm-hmm. we can stick to the pattern of we our body needs more fuel when we are awake to help with hormone, to help with cognition, to help with focus. So when we look at scoping that again, like I said, carbohydrate up till, you know, around the noon, one o'clock, and then a little bit more protein, not saying no protein and no carbohydrate, just the way you scope it. And then it's at nighttime, not eating like, cause we've gotten out of the habit of what it means to eat and sit down and have a meal. Cause you see people eating in their car. You have people who are eating it dinner at 11 o'clock at night, like there we've lost kind of not really the the quote rules of eating, but we've become so disconnected of what it means to be nourished. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I'm eating because I'm bored or I'm eating because I'm hungry or I'm eating because my friend's eating. Like we've become so disconnected. So we think about it from like, okay, what does my body need? It needs energy now and I need to sleep well. So I'm not going to eat two hours before bed because I want a really good parasympathetic response while I'm sleeping. And then I'm going to wake up and body's going to need fuel. So I'm going to eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. That's just a general pattern that everyone I think has lost in modern day. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. And part of it is so much mixed information. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so then if we're, if, if you're, if you're going to hold up to sort of that 12 ish hour window, which is probably the best for gut health and sleep as well, then, yeah. and if, you know, say, take for instance, me, I leave to go work out at six 30 in the morning. So I'll want to back that up from that f- sort of 15, 20 grams of protein that I have at six 30 in the morning to six 30 at night. Right. Or yep. does that, or does that little bump in the morning, not really count? Oh, it's looking at fuel for some training that you're going to be doing, right? It's not going to break into all the health benefits and parasympathetic response you have. So it's 12 hours or it's 11 hours, but you're just getting a good break between 10 and 12 hours where your body can kind of rest, digest, get into parasympathetic, do the reparation it needs that happens while you're sleeping, consolidate memories, consolidate physical activity, stress, all of those things. It's just when you're eating right before bed, then that stays in the system, right? And you can't get into the parasympathetic that you need to have optimal sleep architecture. It's more about sleep. It's more about the sleep and recovery and parasympathetic state that your body needs to get into so that you can actually properly um, refuel by sleeping, right? Or, you know, recover, Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I understand. Let's finish off with some supplements because I feel like this is another area that gets again. There's just so much information about it. Um, you talked about creatine. I had actually never taken creatine until about a week ago, and then I started. And I had I just like it wasn't something that anyone ever really recommended highly. It wasn't something that, and I feel like women get afraid of it because I mean, even my first instinct, I was like, "Ooh, does this like is that water weight? Like a little bit of like I was like, oh, and women get scared of that, but then. It's it's like no the whole point is is that you put lean muscle mass lean muscle mass on and to have more you know a better resting metabolic rate with the amount of lean muscle mass you have and you know even if it, it does goes, do anything it goes further than that so mm-hmm. creatine has now been named by the who as an essential nutrient for women stop it yeah 
And oh my is- God, something that scares so many women is literally an essential. And from what I've heard that to get the right amount of creatine, to get the three grams or four or five or whatever it is that you take, you need like a couple pounds of animal meat. Yeah. And I'm a vegetarian, so oh, I'm shit. already compromised, right? Wow. I know. So when we look at the research and Abby Smith Ryan out of UNC has done a lot of research on creatine, not only like in the sports space, but in the general health space across women's lifespan. So we see that it's essential for pregnancy as well. So women like no supplements during pregnancy, but creatine is actually super beneficial. So when we look at creatine and what it does, it supports all the fast bioenergetics in, in the body. So we're looking at gut health and we're looking at the mucosal membrane of our intestines. And for women, we degrade it a lot faster than men. So this is why we have Mm -hmm. greater incidences of GI distress. We look at brain health and mood, and there've been some really cool clinical trials looking at SSRI and creatine versus just SSRI and really depressive episodes. And women who are adding creatine don't drop into the significant, really severe depressive episodes. And if they do, they come out of it really quickly because creatine is so important for brain health. And women have 70 to 80% of the stores that men have. And then by the nature of not eating as much or being more aware that of the impact of animal protein, they're not eating as much either. So they're really low in creatine. So when we look at that three to five gram dose, it's not a massive dose a day, and it's not going to cause a lot of the side effects that we get with the idea of bodybuilding using creatine. Mm -hmm. But what it does, it feeds forward to, like you said, better muscular performance, better lean mass development, but then we see better mood, better gut health, better recovery, better immunity. So all those things that require a lot of fast, um, accessible energy is supported by creatine. Unbelievable. So every woman should take creatine every day for yep. ever. Yeah. Either that or eat a lot more meat. <laughs> Which is not that, you know, you need protein and creatine, might as well up the chicken, but no. Um, and then so what's the right timing of that? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's just is it like isn't it like a muscle saturation thing or something where you just that's why you keep it up because it Yeah. yeah. So that's why we're like three gram dose, what is that? A half half a teaspoon a day. Yeah. Right. That's not a lot. You can put it in any time. And then that increases muscle saturation, increases gut saturation, brain saturation everywhere. So your body's like, yay, I have some creatine. I'm going to, I'm going to use it and make everything a little bit better. Hell yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad I finally started then. Yeah. Um, how yes. soon does it take to see the, uh, the benefits or the effects of creatine and lean muscle mass and performance? So it takes about three weeks to really, really see and feel a difference. Not that long, but for mood, you start to see a difference in about a week. Yeah. I've never been this happy in my life. There you go. (laughs) Two days. Are you two days in? One day in? Exactly. Like one week and it's transformational. (laughs) Screw all those other supplements and adaptogens. You just need creatine. Um, Okay. What about BCAs? Because I feel like those are one, two that, you know, you hear definitely take it, didn't make a difference, stupid, doesn't work. Is it an important thing as well or not? So when we're looking at branched chain aminos, if we're looking for women to delay central nervous system fatigue, so say you wake up and you've been traveling and you're like, I really want to do the strength workout, but I'm just a little bit flat. If you Mm -hmm. use branched chains, it supports central nervous system. So you can get through that workout as if you weren't jet lagged. So we use it strategically in endurance, um, endurance performance, long stuff, like let's gap your bottle with branched chain amino acids for the second half of the race. Not only is it going to support your body's metabolism by not eating into your lean mass as much in this endurance state also helps with central nervous system fatigue. When we look at it as a supplement to use through the day to help with protein synthesis or other things that they're saying we use branched chains for, it doesn't really work. You need all the essential amino acids. So if you're looking for a supplement, get EAAs, not just branch chains. Because if you're getting all the essential amino acids, the nine of them together, then they work together in the system to actually do what they're supposed to do. So people are like, well, if we talk about leucine so much, maybe I should just supplement with leucine. It's like, no, Mm -hmm. because you need the other ones to actually Mm -hmm. get leucine where it needs to be and do what it needs to do. 
So it's good for energy, sort of can help that in an early morning workout if you feel a little, or just a morning workout that you're feeling a little tired and lethargic. And yeah. other than that, it can help with, I'm trying to see, is there a reason to take it later? In the day? No. Sometimes if someone is vegan and they're using pea protein isolate, which is just yeah. right there on the cusp of having enough leucine for women. Reproductive years, sweet, but when you get into your 40s and onwards, need a little bit more. So we're like, okay, add some fermented branch chain amino acids just to boost the total amount of BCAAs that are in there. And then it all works together. So that would be the only other time that you would do it. Um, and then, like I said, if you're doing Ironman, marathoning, all those ultra endurance type stuff, you can look to use it strategically in your training and your racing to help okay. with that second half of fatigue or you know, just like need to focus. Cool. What about, um, from a protein standpoint, whey protein, pea protein, um, collagen, like, uh, what is the, what, what are, what are the most bioavailable proteins, um, for us to consume? Yeah. So I love the marketing that they're like collagen protein, because although they're amino acids, it does not work as protein the way we think protein works. Because we look at collagen, there are three specific amino acids that are tied into a helix. So when we're looking at native collagen, then this causes an immune response, and those pepti or those um, helices are not absorbed. So if you're looking at native or undenatured collagen, then it causes an immune response, which then tells the body not to break down cartilage, not to break down if its own native or non-denatured. So is there a specific kind of collagen that is good? So then we look at peptides and they can work together. So if you're looking at collagen peptides, right? okay, collagen peptides are little bits of the whole collagen okay. helices that's absorbed, but it goes to the target tissue. It's not used for muscle. It's not used for amino acids in the brain because they're so tightly tied. They go to like where the joint is inflamed and it's like, Hey, here's some building blocks to kind of help with that or the ligament or the skin or the nails, but okay. it doesn't help with lean mass. Oh, so if you're, let's say you're doing a pre-workout, not pre-workout, pre-workout, but pre-workout protein, and you're doing your coffee, then you don't want to use collagen because that's not protein. Nope. You need 15 minimum, you need at least 15 grams of protein. So you'd need whey or pea protein or something else. Yes. So if we look at the bioavailability of proteins, everything's measured against the egg white. So egg white sits about hundred. We see, and this is based on amino acid composition and how, okay. how it is absorbed by the body. Whey protein isolate is 110. And then if we look at whey concentrate, which is often used in a lot of the less expensive supplements, it sits at 80. We look at- So, is, so 100 is perfect, you're saying? Or is, 100 is just like a, how- like a, Okay. Yeah. And so 110 is better? Yeah. The way protein isolate is around 90% of bioavailable protein, whey protein hydrolysate is about 95%. So mm -hmm. if you're doing a scoop and it's like one scoop is 22 grams of protein, it's actually 20 is going to be absorbed from your whey isolates. Is that what you need to consider then when you are considering taking in 15 grams of protein before your workout, let's say, is yeah. you need to think, okay, well, this is not going to be fully bioavailable. So it says 15 grams, but I know I need to get 25 or something like that so that I get enough protein to actually do the job. Yeah. That's why, because it's really confusing when you get into the weeds mm -hmm. like that, I just tell people <laughs> use a whey isolate or a whey hydrolysate and you do the one scoop or the two tablespoons of that and you're good to go. Okay. If you're vegan and you're using pea protein isolate and we know that it sits around 90 well, we're going to use two and a half tablespoons Got to it. make sure that you get what you need. So it's just a little bit, you need a, a big, heavy scoop of pea protein isolate or just a level scoop of whey isolate. Okay. Okay. What about beta alanine? Beta alanine is interesting because it does work in women and causes a vasodilatory response and it increases muscle carnosine, but it doesn't have the same kind of impact on performance that it does for men. Oh, really? So it's not as, yeah, it's not as efficacious. It does work. Do I just and, need to double my dosage? 
Well, no, use it strategically, right? So if you're like, okay, I'm going in and I'm doing a really heavy training session today and I want to try to hit a few PRs or push a little bit more. Yeah. Then use it before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the other one that really is circulating is like beet juice and nitrates, right? You hear everyone use beet juice, nitrates, Mm -hmm. nothing for reproductive women doesn't work because estrogen is really tightly tied to endothelial function and the nitric oxide cycle in our vessels. So if you're going to dose with nitrates, it doesn't necessarily read it. And it's like, yeah, there's no performance benefit. And sometimes there's a, a decrement depending on if you're in high hormone phase or not. But we see in late perimenopause and postmenopausal women, it's beautiful because we have less vascular compliance. We've lost estrogen. We need to have some kind of help in our vasodilatory and constrictin response. Mm -hmm. Using nitrates really helps. And it also helps attenuate hot flashes and night sweats Mm -hmm. because the body has a better understanding of getting rid of heat through vasodilation and controlling through constriction. So we're looking at almost putting it into a rhythm then. Yeah. 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 So nitrates, great when you're getting to the menopause transition and you're in postmenopause, not great when you are in your reproductive years, doesn't do anything. Mm. Beta alanine, use strategically, don't like load it and use it every day, but Mm. use it before a really hard workout to be able to push a little bit more and get a little bit more out of that workout. So is it like creatine that you need to be consistent with it though? Is it so, you know, just since like for me, I only train and I would think most people don't hardcore train every day, right. or train every day. So only do it on those days. It's just literally just to, it's essentially like a little bit of a pre-workout. Yeah. But you don't even have to think about that. So say you're periodizing your training, right? And mm-hmm. you're like, okay, well, I'm doing uh, three weeks working on my squat. So mm-hmm. I'm going to do... Uh, a one rep max for my squat. You don't want to use it for that one rep max because you want a true representation of that first one rep max. (laughs) And then you go through a block of training, right? And then you're like, okay, well, here's where I'm really loading because I want to get a really good training effect. Maybe it's Mm -hmm. the second week. You're doing a lot of cluster sets or you're doing Mm -hmm. heavy twos. Use it then. Because the idea of training is to create a stress that your body is like, I need to overcome this and get stronger. Mm -hmm. So you want to use it strategically in that way. And then when you get to your third or fourth block and you're like, I need to do another one rep max test, don't use it because you want to see what your true one rep max is. Um, What about, I've said the word pre-workout and I know that can be a popular thing for people is to get their pre-workout in. So is this just, is this just a totally pointless? Is there wine? Is it why not? Or are you just consuming a whole bunch of long, long word ingredients for no reason? So we look at most of the pre-workouts, all they are is caffeine and ways to extend the caffeine half-life. There are some really good non-caffeinated pre-workouts that have things like glutamine and maca and rhodiola. So you have your adaptogens that help with focus, that helps with central nervous system. You have glutamine that helps with gut health. So those are the kinds of things that you would want in a pre-workout Mm because it's supporting your physiology. It's not like making you so amped and jacked that you're like, oh, I got to hit it hard. So we see all these people are using these pre-workouts and and some people end up with really significant heart issues because it's so much caffeine and holding it. It's like, let's just, <laughs> it's coffee and then pre-workout, right? Yeah, oh, I know. And then coffee and you're yeah. just dosing. Yeah. But huh. I mean, if, if you're like, oh, I have this pre-workout, it makes me feel really great. Again, you know, periodize it, phase it in, phase it out. Like what are your key workouts? Because people forget that when you're going to work out, it's for a specific reason. It's to hit certain intensities, it's to hit certain workloads so that it's a really significant stress on the body that it needs to then understand, overcome to get fitter. So this is what I'm like, if you're doing cluster sets and you're like, I really need to eke out the last two, but if I don't have um, branch chains or I don't have my pre-workout, then I'm not going to get it. But then you might want to use it. But I'm, mm. I'm the adage of it's like, okay, let's put some branch chains in the drink bottle and let's use some beta alanine before, because then you're yeah. controlling what you're taking and you know what you're taking. Yeah. But if you get a mix of pre-workout, you're not sure. And you don't know what kind of fillers and flow agents might also be in there that can cause some issues. Right, right. 
Right. So if you're if you're kind of macro dosing your pre workout, you take ba- you take you know branch chains, you take your beta alanine, you get your 15 grams of protein in, and you hit the gym and you yep. go crush it. Yep. Exactly. Okay. All right. Let's talk about crushing it. Um, workouts been something like oh my god. I mean, I wrote a book called Pretty Intense that was like two a days and all the intervals and high intensity. And none of the workouts were too much longer than like 20, 25 minutes other than one a week. And it's just like, you know, that was just my thing. But, you know, I've just obviously learned so much since then. And I'm older, you know, yep. and I'm older. So uh, things just generally kind of have their arcs. So um, let's talk about the place for high intensity. I mean, I did CrossFit for so long. So like, let's talk about where, where that kind of workout fits in and for who. Yeah. I just broke up with CrossFit a few weeks ago. It's sad, isn't it? Like I loved it. I loved it, but it just, you know, I just, I killed myself. Yeah. It wasn't. I'm sorry. Let's rip, rip CrossFit right now. Yeah. Well, not ripping it. We're just saying like, there's a time and a place. And then I have women who are in their forties and fifties and they love it and they want to stay in it. And I'm like, okay, but you have to make each wad work for your body. So you have to go in with the decision that it's going to be a heavy resistance training day. So you really maximize the strength component and then just move during the Metcon. Cruise during the Metcon. Yeah. Don't get competitive. If you're yeah, a competitor, be- don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so hard. <laughs> so hard. Yeah, just wasn't working for me. It's like, like I haven't done bar muscle ups in a couple months, but I'm sure I'll be fine. Here I go. Yeah. It's like, I don't need to do 30 bar muscle ups followed by like 15 <laughs> handstand push ups followed by, you know, all, I'm like, that's not functional for my body. It's going to get me injured. Right. Um, I love it, but it's just not right for, for my body either. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we're talking about high intensity, this is where it gets a misconception too. We talk about true high intensity interval training or true high intensity. There's the umbrella term of hit, and then you have sprint interval training in that as well. Okay. So we're talking about hit. Yeah. So if we talk about sprint interval training, this is Mm -hmm. 30 seconds or less of supra maximal intensity. So you're Mm -hmm. really pushing the gas. You're going as hard as you can for 30 seconds, and then you want to fully recover it until you hit it again. And when you first start that, you might be able to do four or five of those 30 seconds and then poof, you can't do anymore. And that's fine. Sure. When we talk about HIT or that high intensity interval training, this is where it goes awry a lot of times because people are thinking that these F45s or orange theories or these boot camp like high intensity classes at the gym is high intensity, but it's not because you can't sustain high intensity for 45 so minutes to an hour. So you true. fall into moderate intensity, right? So, so, so true. To redefine high intensity interval training with the correct definition, it is an interval that lasts from 30 seconds to the most five minutes. And it's between 80 and 95% of your max. So if you're doing one minute, then it's closer to the 95%. If you're doing five minutes, it's closer to the 80%. Mm -hmm. And you have variable recovery. It could be one minute. It could be five minutes. But the goal of high intensity interval training is more of that anaerobic metabolic conditioning to be able to sustain that kind of really intense effort for a little bit longer period of time. When we talk about sprint interval training, that's different. That's about a central nervous system that's go all out trying to get a true epigenetic change within the muscle. So we have better glucose control. We have better um, muscle expression to handle stress. So there are two different things. But all up, a high intensity interval training session wouldn't be more than 35 minutes. And that's with a warm up and a cool down. It's like 20, 25 minutes of work, really. And those in those 20, 25 minutes, are you saying, like, hey, I, I'm only going for 30 seconds? Like, I mean, I can't sprint the same speed for 30 seconds. So let's just say I go all out for 30 seconds. I'm recovering for four minutes sometimes, yeah. three, three yeah. minutes, something like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. If you're someone who's like, what, that sounds awful. Then you could do like a buy-in workout. And that's one of my, one of my favorite ways of explaining it is like, you have 12 minutes and you're doing every other minute of work. And in that first minute, you're doing 10 deadlifts at 70%. And then as soon as you finish that, you're hopping on an erg of some sort, and you're trying to accumulate as many meters as you can for the rest of that minute fully recover the next minute, then you do it again. And the goal is to get more meters each time. Mm. So you want to go faster and faster and faster. 
usually people hold about the same amount, but from a rating perceived exertion, they push themselves and they're fully gassed. And that is a true like high intensity sprint interval workout. It's a good way to get someone to actually tap out because it's hard. I was going to say it's a difficult, difficult marker, especially if you're not someone who's been competitive in your life very much to know what 80, 95% looks like. Most people never see 95% in their life. No, because it's too uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to vomit. Yep. That's what we want. We want that feeling because that means that you're really pushing. Do you have to sit down? Do you have to lay down? Yeah. That's pretty close then. That's good. We like that. Yeah. Yeah. People are like, well, you want to put older women in? I'm like, yeah, I do. (laughs) Because that's what you need. Really? So t- tell me about that. Cause that's not something part of my program right now. So what, 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 where does that, where would that fit in? Where does that fall? So when we're looking at um, how our estrogen progesterone changes, when mm-hmm. we start to get into our forties and beyond the thing about estrogen is it's responsible, not only for stimulating our muscle cell development, our satellite cell, but it's also responsible for how strong our muscle contraction is because oh. it, it's responsible for how strong myosin bonds uh, binds to actin for that muscle contraction. Mm. And it also is responsible for how much acetylcholine is being held in the area where the nerves come down and then hop the little gap junction to like stimulate the muscle contraction. Oh, mm. So when we start to lose estrogen, we lose power and we lose strength. So this is where the first thing that women notice as they're starting to get closer and closer to menopause is like, I don't have power, speed, or strength anymore. What's going Hmm. on? Hmm. So this is where your resistance training comes in. Fantastic. But we're looking at heavy resistance training. We're not looking at those eight to 15 reps. No, it's a blend of strength and hypertrophy both. Okay. So we want a central nervous system tap in. So we want to actually create that adaptation where the central nervous system is doing what estrogen used to do. Where it's like, okay. That's the high intensity? No, that's the heavy lift. That's the heavy lifting. Okay. Mm Okay. So then when we look at high intensity exercise, we hear, oh, you shouldn't do high intensity because it increases cortisol. And if we go back to those definitions, yes, if you're doing those 45 minute classes, then yes, you are going to get that increase in cortisol. But if you're doing true high intensity work, like we just talked about the sprint interval or the true high intensity, you get a boost of growth hormone, a boost of anti-inflammatory and oxidative properties and a boost in your testosterone. Huh. So we're looking at helping our bodies get healthier and maintain better hormonal control. We need to fit in some sprint interval and some true high intensity. So we mm-hmm. say maybe two sprint interval sessions or one sprint and one high intensity with your resistance training in a week. Oh, it's yes. not a lot. Of, and but- so the high intensity would be more of your one to five minute sort of, is it something like a deadlift and a skier kind of a routine Versus, or is that also considered your high intensity um, uh, cardio sort of training? So if we're going to do like the buy-in workout that I just talked about, the deadlifts Mm -hmm. and the erg, Mm -hmm. that fits in with your sprint interval because it's one minute of lifting and 30 seconds hard as you think. Give me an example of, uh, of more of a high intensity intensity. training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this would be like getting on the ski erg and holding a 80% pace. So maybe... Oh gosh, because I don't know how strong you are on the ski erg. So I'd say like a one minute 4,500, but mm-hmm. who knows? You know, so you're holding a 500 right. meter pace mm-hmm. for a minute 30, and then you have a minute 30 off to recover. So it's light active recovery. So you're just bringing the heart rate down a little bit. And then oh, you're so bumping. It's just a level below sprint. Yeah. Just oh, a level it's below. It's a level below sprint. Yeah. So Kinda you're it's- 80%. Hits more or sprints more of your 90, you know, if we're going to kind of rank them, it's like, yeah, want to be okay. It's just a different level, but you can use the same actions. Yep. They just have different, they're just different timing. Yep. A little bit lower intensity and less recovery. Got it. I got it. And that also can be a 30 minute session, including a warm up cool down kind of thing or. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And how long should your warm up cool down be for those? I usually say you take the first 10 minutes to like mobilize, get it used to the movement that you're going to do. So if you're going to be doing deadlifts, you're doing a lot of hinging work, you're doing yep. like good mornings with the band. So you're yep. really getting into and firing and getting yep. all those muscles ready to go. And then for your cool down, it's all about let's really start to bring that heart rate down, flush out the muscles, and then do some more mobilization to make sure that you're not going to 
stay crooked or, you know, how your body falls when it starts to get fatigued. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Let me think if there's any other workout questions. I think that's good. Is there anything else you recommend for training? Plyometrics, <laughs> jump training. Yeah. Because we're looking at bone health. And a lot of people are like, okay, well, I run. That should be good for my bones. No. We know that running isn't a multi-directional stress. It doesn't help with bone health. Yeah. We need some jumping. So if we're looking at plyometrics, it's twofold. One, it helps with that sprint interval. It could be counted as a sprint interval. I was session. just going to ask because, dude, squat jumps and things like that, broad jumps. I mean, yeah. you could you can die doing that stuff. Yeah. So you Jumping can use lunges. As, yes, exactly. So you can use that as your sprint interval, but you want to have that jump component for bone health. So we're looking at that multi-directional stress from landing from the jump. And that's like, boom, let's keep those bones strong and healthy. Uh Okay, cool. Okay. So those are the big ones. Yeah. Um, Okay. What about rest? Let's kind of like bring it home a little bit with that because that of all things, oh shit, can't forget birth control since that's such a big thing. Um, Let's just finish up with sort of training workout and then get into that. But um, I never rested, man, ever. I mean, I've, I, I just didn't, I mean, I think I even wrote in the book, like uh, rest days naturally happen. I was like, you know, you don't plan them. You're traveling, you're working, whatever. They just happen. But I, now I would, cause I mean, even on my, I basically work out, I feel like three days a week and the other three days are such low intensity. They don't feel taxing whatsoever. Good. So I would say, and, and, and I've had, I had incredible biomarker feedback by doing this for a month with, you know, inflammation and, you know, true, like I did this treatment called Ibu, which is this blood dialysis that wicks off inflammation. It filters the blood. You can see what your oxidative stress is like coming back into the arm after it's been filtered. And just with one month of doing that, I went from having 450 milliliters of inflammation come off of my blood, half of my blood to 150. I went from being able to handle the um, ozone uh, cause it's when it's a 60 minute process. I, I could only handle it for 30 minutes and I could handle the entire 60 without my blood being really dark coming back into my other arm. So like I'm an, I have been so far off with recovery so yeah. far. Off. And it's one of those understated, just like nutrition is understated. So often we think we can outrun a bad diet, but you can't outrun recovery either because the whole, like, like I keep coming back to is like, why are you training? You're training to create a greater stress on the body. So the body's like, I have to adapt to that. But if you never give it time to adapt, then you're always going to be in a breakdown state. If you're in a breakdown state, first thing that goes is lean mass. First thing that goes up is inflammation and oxidation. And we know none of those are good and viable for health. <laughs> so we look at not only for health, but if you're someone who's competitive or want to do some kind of like 5k, 10k, whatever it is, CrossFit open, who knows, you need (laughs) recovery in order to adapt and get fitter. So if we're looking at recovery metrics, it doesn't mean necessarily sitting on your butt and doing nothing, but it's that polarized, super low intensity work. Because if you're doing true high intensity and sprint interval, you need recovery because you can't do that every day. You can't go to the gym and be like, I'm going to do this every day. Your body just won't allow you and you're going to fall into that moderate intensity, tired, but wired, sympathetically driven. Your body's going to break down. You're going to put on belly fat. You're going to go, what the hell is going on? Recovery is so essential. And as we get older, we find we need more recovery. We see though on that women are more endurant. So when we're looking at fatigability and endurance, Mm -hmm. when we're doing reps and sets in our resistance training, we don't need as much recovery between because our bodies, our muscles, our muscle architecture is less fatigable than men. So we need a little bit more of a dose response to get adaptation. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about recovery from day to day, we start to see women need a little bit more because we don't have the same kind of muscle enzymes for fast twitch that men do. Our bodies need a little bit more time to absorb that hard training, recover from it before we can hit it hard again. So I tend to tell people like, if you're looking at a week, And you're someone who's like, I always have lots of energy at the beginning of the week. And then it starts to taper off. It's like, okay, well, let's moderate that. 
let's do like a Monday evening session and maybe a Tuesday morning session and then Wednesday's off and then maybe a Thursday evening session, Friday's off. And then you might do something on the weekend. Yeah. And when I say off, I mean really low intensity. And when you're doing a session, that's like your resistance training or your sprint. So it's you're trying to really like polarize where you're putting it, giving your body adequate recovery. Yeah. And the reason why you're bookending a Monday night and a Tuesday morning is so that Monday you're sleeping in, being able to deal with what happens on a Monday. And then you do your hard session Monday night, and then you get another dose response by doing it Tuesday morning. So it compounds the responses. You get a better Um, adaptation. Better stress. There's more adaptation needed because you kind of, you put them so close together, but then you give yourself a bigger block of a break. Yeah. Because then you have all of Tuesday, the rest of Tuesday, all of Wednesday, most of Thursday, then you hit Friday. And then Friday is really, really hard again, and your body can handle it. Damn. Okay, I'd be remiss though to, before I move on to not ask about body recomposition sort of puzzle of yeah, like what's the quickest way to do that to have a body recomp? And then I'm curious about like bulking and cutting. That's not something that I've ever done. I'm not sure it's something I'd really love to do, but it seems like it's the sometimes the quickest way to get certain results just because you give yourself the adequate nutrition to grow muscles, but then have sort of cut. So what's the, what's the most efficient way to maintain and grow lean body mass, but then Mm -hmm. reduce body fat? When we're looking at, you had the key factor there, like eating to build your muscle because so many women don't eat enough and you need abundance to actually build muscle. Right. So you're doing your heavy resistance training. And for women, we know that when you're doing heavy resistance training, especially like squats and deadlifts, it increases the mobilization of abdominal fat. So by the nature of actually doing resistance training, you're helping with body recomp. So if you're doing your build phase, right, and you're polarizing, like I just said, like the double dose and then another hard one, so you can actually get harder then we look strategically to do one sprint interval, maybe on Wednesday night. And we have a slight calorie restriction every night. So when we're looking at what are we doing? Okay, we're going to take out maybe 150 to 200 calories every night, but only over the course of one block of training. So you build and you're like, I got to cut. Okay, how am I going to cut? Well, we keep our resistance training and we add in one sprint interval session to really top in, like create a a different stress. Mm -hmm. And then we have a very slight calorie restriction. So it's Along- kind of so you're bulking and cutting within the week. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then the other thing is really upping that protein. So we see that when you're in a calorie deficit, if you are maintaining that 1.1 to 1.2 grams per pound, you strip body fat and you keep your lean mass. So women who are eating a lot and they're like, "Yeah, I need protein, protein, protein." It's like it's really hard press. Even with my Olympic lifters, they're still not eating enough protein to get that muscle. Because it's really hard to think about how much protein you need to eat because they're like, what do you mean? I need 150 to 160 grams a day. So like, well, that's what you need to build it and to, and to lose some of the body fat. So protein becomes really important. Yeah. There is a study I've been talking about recently because a friend of mine from um, Florida, he posted it and he's like, look at this really cool study on protein. And they took um, normal weight, but obese women. So, you know, like skinny fat. Mm -hmm. And there was this big cohort and they split them and none of them were doing exercise. They're just normal daily life. And they split them. And all they did was increase the protein intake in one group to 1.6 grams per kilo. So that's just right around that 0.8 to 0.9 grams per pound. Mm -hmm. And then the other group maintained their normal, which was like 0.8 grams per kilo. So what is that 0.5 per pound ish, or maybe a little bit less. Yeah. Over the course of 12 weeks, no exercise, people with a higher protein intake completely recomp their body. No exercise. The same, same calories too? Same like, calories. Like, okay, got it. They just- No just calorie change. Macro adjustment. Yep, exactly. So protein is so powerful when you're bumping it up and your body's like, ooh, look at this. I can build lean mass. I don't need to store fat because I can build lean I mass. I have the building blocks. Yes, Exactly. So, you know, we talk about exercise and resistance training being the key all, but if you don't have adequate protein, you're not going to maximize that and you're not going to recomp. So protein, super important. 
So you talked about a calorie deficit just on the days where you're not training essentially of sort of one or 200 calories. What does it do if you stay in a slight calorie deficit, not too much of a calorie deficit, but your training is sort of spread out? Is there, is that just like a less effective way? Can you even recomp if you, if you don't have adequate amount of calories for the work that you're doing, are you just defeating the whole purpose? Yes. That's the short answer. Yes. Because as I was talking about earlier, right, if you don't have enough stuff coming in, then your hypothalamus is like, hey, we're in a survival mode. I better start putting stuff on and downregulating the thyroid to conserve, conserve, conserve and have endocrine dysfunction. If you are bookending your workouts with really adequate nutrition, then you have a slight calorie deficit. That's something different. But a lot of people aren't onto it that much. So they're like, oh, calorie deficit. I'm just not going to eat that many calories or I'm going to skip this, or I'm going to skip that. And so they end up in too much of a calorie deficit and they don't actually pay attention to how they're fueling in around their training. If we're really specific, then we can make sure that we're getting enough carbohydrate and enough protein in around training to support that and Mm -hmm. to tell the hypothalamus, yeah, yeah, we got enough. And -hmm. then look, okay, here's a slight calorie deficit of maybe a hundred calories on the days that we train. On the days that we don't train, maybe we're bumping it to 150, 200, but it's always in the evening so that your body's not like, Hey, wait, what's going on? Right. And so low impact steady state stuff is not considered, um, uh, one of your training days, correct? Right. If you're going out for like an hour and a half, then yeah, it's going to be fuel depleting, even if it is super low steady state. So that would be part of your calorie deficit. If you are going out for 45 minutes to an hour, it's 50% or less of, of your max capacity and it's just kind of like moving, mm-hmm. then no, that's just moving. And then as far as for those people who don't consume animal protein like yourself, what, what are your best tips to get enough protein? Wide variety, wide variety of fruits, veggies. I know people are like, what? Veggies, protein, peas, green peas, lots of protein in there, right? And NAMI. We look at nuts and seeds. We look at sprouted grain breads. Bread's good, especially a lot of protein in sprouted grain breads. Tempeh for fermentation. I'm not a fan of tofu, primarily because I can't handle soy, but I don't find it a really fantastic source of protein. I'd rather err on the side of tempeh because you have more bang for your buck. We're mm-hmm. looking at nutrient density. Um, and then, yeah, and there's times and places when you're really trying to up your protein where you have to supplement. And that's just part of it. Like you can't eat Powder, enough. Powdered protein. Yeah. About. yeah. 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 So don't be afraid to implement it. It's there to use. Let's finish off with just sort of like a little bit of a wake up call of the, of birth for birth control, because I feel like it's one of those things that in the general population is getting a lot of awareness to its um, detriment, everything from, uh, you know, disrupting your not having a real cycle and having a withdrawal bleed, which Mm -hmm. I didn't even know until a few years ago. um, Cause I took birth control for 16 years. Um, to every to even studies showing that women that are on contraceptive oral contraceptive or birth control are choosing different men than if they weren't on birth control they choose more feminine men when they're on birth control than when they're off so essentially if you've got a if you if your woman has is on birth control you're together and then she gets off of it she might not like you. Yep. I know. It's strange, isn't it? It is. And then I just think about the poor side effect of it reducing testosterone, correct? It reduces testosterone in in women yeah. as well, which I think I took it for my whole career. So essentially, this is what was happening with my much needed, like, uh, for yeah, my job. Yep. Like, yep. fuck. When we look at OCs, And the combined oral contraceptive pill, right? So when we look at it, there's so many different formulations. When we're looking at the progestin component, that's the important part. This is where we start to see that you have a lot of aggression depending on what, if it's more androgenic. So this is why the studies are coming out. It's like, if a woman's on an OC and she's looking for a more effeminate man, it's because she feel the androgenicity of that progestin is making her like really aggressive. And it's like, yeah, okay. I want to be the alpha in the, in the relationship here. When we look from performance metrics, um, we look at the estrogen and the progesterone component. 
So we know that if someone is using a 30 microgram dose of estradiol in their oral contraceptive pill, it builds muscle really easily, but there's no strength that accompanies that muscle bulk. Weird. So it's like, why do I want to build more muscle fibers when it doesn't actually make me stronger? If we look at 20 microgram dose, it doesn't really do anything different than naturally cycling. We look at oxidative stress. It's much higher just across the board for women who are taking oral contraceptive pill. We see inflammation factors much higher for women using it across the board. And we also see that training schematics change. So we know that if we are looking at training really, really hard, it's the first five days of the active pill where you can push hard and recover well. And it's the last five days of the placebo pill that you can train really, really hard and recover well. Because when you're on it, it's not like you have the steady state dose. You have a peak and a trough every day, which is why- 10 days from the start of your bleed, essentially ish until five days in, five days after ish. Yeah. Because you have this accumulation of hormones and that's how it works to like suppress your own ovarian hormones. And with each subsequent day of increasing those active hormones, knowing that the estradiol component is 500 times greater on a cellular level than your natural production. What does that mean? So that means that every time you take a pill and it accumulates, you're getting a greater and greater and greater negative response on a cell level from these hormones because we have receptors everywhere in our body. And so that's why we're finding there's less power availability for training. It blunts sprint adaptation. It blunts Hmm. anaerobic capacity. Um, And we're seeing that from a neuromuscular and fatigability standpoint, there are certain times during the oral contraceptive pill where you just like, can't do it. So when I'm working with someone, I'm like, do you really need to be on combined oral contraceptive pill? Or Mm. can we look at something like the IUD? Mm -hmm. Because if we're using an IUD, Even if it's a marina with a little bit of progestin, you still ovulate. So you can still track your cycle. You don't have as great systemic effects. And if you're like, nah, I don't want to use an IUD, then maybe we look at like the vaginal ring or an estradiol patch, something that's not- Vaginal ring, that's what I used. Yeah, it's great. Oh, really? Was that like a good option then? Yeah, because it's more of a localized dose, right? So you're looking at localized dose. It's not as systemic. And it's because when you- are looking at how your body metabolizes and uses hormones. When it naturally produces it, it goes to the liver first and it gets bound up by sex hormone binding globulin that then gets excreted into the intestines through bile. And then your little gut bugs are like, ooh, let's unbind it and kick it back out. And then you have estrogen, progesterone, testosterone that work for you. When you're taking an oral contraceptive pill, it doesn't go to the liver. It doesn't have that hepatic pass. So it goes into the digestive system and you only have 25% bioavailability, which is why the doses are so high. And because you don't have that control through the liver, it's very arbitrary how women are going to respond to it. Of course, there's going to be ovarian suppression, but you don't know necessarily how the other systems are going to be affected. That's why we're really starting to dig in and be like, okay, what is 20 versus 30 doing? Is, that to, is there anything to do with like detoxification pathways? Is that sort of mm-hmm. like, like glutathione would sort of change the trajectory of the bioavailability mm-hmm. or how much gets delivered, how fast it gets to you, how much? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also the SIP gene, because, you know, your liver is responsible for all the detox and all those pathways. So if it doesn't hit the liver, then yeah, your body has to be like, oh, what else do I do with this thing? Um, and a lot of the original research on OCs wasn't done on women either. So we're looking at male rats and then we had some male test subjects. So even their metabolism is different. So all in all, like the origins of the OC, great, you know, because it gave women more empowerment and reproductive rights. But then when you look retrospectively, you're like, that's another way to control women because it's really downgrading their natural system. So that's Mm -hmm. why I'm like, look, vaginal ring, it is just localized. I do you just localized and we're looking at the localization of those hormones and the effect just on the, on the cervix and the re- and the mucosal membrane. It's all about like barrier to sperm. It's not about changing your ovarian hormone responses or anything like that. So, it, but is there still, is it still just a withdrawal bleed though with the vaginal ring versus the IUD? 
No, you just don't ovulate. When we're looking at the vaginal ring, when you mm -hmm. first put it in, it can suppress ovulation. And then as you know, like you get to the third week, your body's like, oh, I can, I can possibly ovulate. So it's hit or miss depending on how long you've used it. There's more anovulatory cycles on the vaginal ring. Okay. With the IUD, it's about eight months after insertion, then you start ovulating again. Hmm. So it's, yeah, but the wow. systemic effects are different. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah. high five myself. Shows yeah, good, good work. That's good. Um, okay. I mean, I feel like that covers quite a bit of it. I mean, I, you're just such a wealth of knowledge and I just appreciate your, all your information. It's just, there's just not that many, there's just not that many people that are not that many women. And I think it really takes women because it takes a passion for understanding it to really be as comprehensive as you are. So thank you for sharing so many, so, so much truth around how we work. And is, is, is there a place in the future where there should be more women used in these studies? I mean, I feel like what I heard was that because of reproductive years, it's, it's been dangerous to use women because it could affect that. So that's a lot of times why women weren't used in some of the studies, but is that bullshit? Like, why is it that yeah. the studies are so bad? Or so, so between. yeah. So when we look at the modernization of medicine and scientific design, it was at a point where men were like, women are have smaller brains and they're delicate flowers and they don't know anything. So when we look at like how things evolved, it's all been through that male lens. So scientific design has always been through the male lens. And in, I mean, it was a point not too long ago where women going through perimenopause were put in insane asylums because no one understood what was going on. And if you look retrospectively, almost all the women that were killed as witches in the Salem witch hunt were women who were perimenopausal because of hot flashes and mood disorder. So people like primarily men are like, these women are crazy and they're witches. Wow. So there's a long history of the male lens on all of this stuff. So we look specifically at scientific design. Originally, it was male rats and it was cis men. And that model is broken. And people are seeing that it's broken. We see things like Ambien. You know, it stays in the women's system a lot longer. So people are like, oh, gosh, what the hell? So medical community, even though it was like in the 90s that NIH said, you can't just use male rats. You can't just use men. But it's just in the past four to five years where people are like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, really? We have to use women. And I will say one benefit of the COVID pandemic is the outcomes between women and men in the vaccine and the vaccine rates and success in the vaccine. What rate. was that? I don't even know that statistic. It was better for women. Women got less sick and they had less time being sick than men. And mm -hmm. then they're looking now at long COVID and unfortunately it's reversed. But now people are really going, what's going on? If that happened, then there are sex differences. So yeah. if, if it was not that case, if men did better than women, never would have been the conversation. But because women did better than men on the vaccine, it oh. made so many people globally in the medical community look up and be like, what? Mm -hmm. And then in sports science and nutrition, I've been in this for, oh gosh, a couple of decades, but it's really just been in the past four or five years where we've had you know, like Don Scott, who's been tracking menstrual cycle on the US soccer team coming out and saying, hey, We've had better outcomes when we're tracking the menstrual cycle. And people are like, what? What do you mean? And so it's been feeding forward back into the scientific community. You have to clean up that scientific design and include women. No longer as a re peer reviewer, am I going to like yell at the assistant editor that they passed me a paper that said, we excluded women because they have a menstrual cycle. And I was like, that is not an appropriate exclusion. You send a desk rejection. So now we're seeing more desk rejections for that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's getting better we still have a long way to go. Yeah. Obviously, you know, just to touch on it, just because it's something that's been part of my puzzle piece was, um, and I feel like it's just more prevalent in women. And I'm wondering if you've seen anything in your field dealing with so many women, um, probably less because of the nature of what they're doing. But um, I had breast implants for seven and a half years and had those removed and definitely think that was part of my endocrine disruptor and suppression of hormones, thyroid, gut health, so many different things. Um, is that anything that has caught your radar or? Um, yeah, it's the materials used for sure. And we see that. And we also see it in implants for prosthetics, like hip replacements sure. and knee replacements. 
Yeah. Sure. Because again, all of it's been done on male data, even breast implants, like male data, where they're looking what? at what I know. So they're looking at like, when we start it and we got to make sure the efficacy is safe, then they started it on male rats. So they didn't take it because they, you know, it's pretty steady. So let's just use male rats. And then when it gets into like the clinical trials, of course, they're using women, but the original efficacy data stem from male rats. I'm sure they lived long enough to show the results. I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Well, so much to so much to digest and use and better ourselves, but then also so many, so many areas to still improve. So Thank you. Thank you so much yeah. for taking the time from all the way across the world. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's been fun chatting. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.